Our story begins a couple decades ago at the 27th Annual Conference on Very Large Databases. One of the research papers on caching techniques did not stand out at the time, but it introduced a new data organization model named PAX, which would have a major impact on distributed computing a dozen years later when three data storage formats were created that were all based on its hybrid columnar model. The open source ORC format was developed by Facebook and Hadoop vendor Hortonworks, primarily to speed up Hive queries. The open source Parquet format was developed by Twitter and Hadoop vendor Cloudera for all Hadoop projects, and Snowflake developed a proprietary format for its cloud data warehouse. The format's file extension comes from the French words for flake of snow. I'll use Parquet to continue the story because its logo, which looks like a Parquet floor tile, serves as a good analogy. Parquet is a type of flooring made by arranging small slats of wood into a repeating columnar pattern. We can think of this as an abstraction for tabular columns, which can be divided into rows, giving us the ability to access a certain column from a particular row. Traditional databases and file formats store data row after row, keeping all columns from a row together. In columnar formats, the values from each column are grouped together. The benefit of columnar storage is seen when you need data from only a subset of columns. For example, if we need values from only the third column, we have an inefficient access pattern with a row-oriented format because we need to read entire rows of data and then pick out just the values from the columns that we need. With a columnar format, we have a nice sequential access pattern where we can read data from only the required column. So the columnar model has clear benefits, but it wasn't well adopted when it was introduced in the 1980s. Issues occur when you need to add new rows. To keep all the data from each column together, we would need to push all the values after the first column over and then insert the column one values from the new rows. Then we would need to repeat this inefficient pattern over and over again, inserting new values for each of the other columns. Let's see how Parquet solved this problem. Instead of using a columnar format, Parquet uses a hybrid columnar method to break up data into row groups. A single row group contains data from all columns for some number of rows. When you need to read a single column from a Parquet file, you read the corresponding column chunk from all row groups, not the entire contents of each row group. Snowflake uses a similar concept, but it calls its contiguous units of storage micropartitions instead of row groups. My illustrations contain a small amount of data, but in reality, micropartitions can contain up to 500 megabytes, depending on the type of data and the compression algorithms used. When you load data into Snowflake, the system automatically divides your data into micropartitions and saves each as an FDN file in object storage. Each file contains header metadata with the offset in length of each column chunk. When Snowflake processes a SQL query, it makes an API call to read a micropartition and uses this metadata to receive only data from the columns required by the SQL. When the Snowflake system was being created, the main focus in distributed database research was about improving SQL on Hadoop projects. Network transfer speeds were slow back when Hadoop was created in the early 2000s, so Hadoop used an architecture that co-located files with the CPUs that would process them. For all its promise, Hadoop was too often used to process uncompressed 
human-readable files, like CSVs dumped out of relational database tables. A decade later, when transfer speeds increased by an order of magnitude, cheap, durable object storage could be used as a persistent storage layer so data could scale independently from compute. And hybrid columnar formats made it possible to transfer only the required columns in small, compressed binary packages. Snowflake's architecture employs three layers which communicate back and forth with each other. I'll use simple SQL queries to illustrate how these three layers interact. This is a layer of services written in Java which perform all operations except for the actual processing of SQL queries. Services access metadata in a Foundation DB database, which is an open source key value store that enables high speed reads and writes. Snowflake maintains a pool of ready to run clusters to reduce spin up time. When your SQL query needs to be processed and your chosen cluster is not currently active, the infrastructure service activates a cluster of virtual machines. Again, when we say data is loaded into Snowflake, what we mean is that it's transformed into Snowflake's proprietary format and stored as micropartitions in a cloud object storage container. Here's a look at Snowflake's browser-based interface for submitting SQL queries. My query is accessing data from the line item table. A table is really just an entity defined in the metadata database as a set of pointers to micropartition files in object storage. The metadata contains the minimum and maximum values stored inside each column of each micropartition, so the optimizer service can already eliminate many of the FDN files from consideration based on this SQL predicate. Our query needs data from only four columns, so that will further reduce the amount of data that needs to be transferred from object storage. So, based on the metadata, the compute cluster will be instructed to fetch data from only a subset of files and copy data from only a subset of their columns onto the compute cluster's solid state drives. Now that the data is local to the compute cluster, it can process the query and send the results to the management layer, which sends them to the user, stores them in the result cache, and logs query statistics into the metadata database. Back in the Snowflake interface, we can examine the query history. I'll zoom into the statistics section to highlight the fact that our query only required data from 21 of the 10,000 plus micropartitions for the line item table. So only a tiny fraction of the table had to be transferred across the network from object storage to the compute cluster. Let's go back to the original query and then create a fairly similar second version. The second query contains three of the four columns from the first query, but the date ranges are different, so none of the data needed for the second query was transferred to the compute cluster while the first query was being processed. Therefore, when we look at the statistics for the second query, we see that none of the data could be sourced from the compute cluster's raw data cache, so it had to be copied over from object storage. The result of the second query was stored in the query result cache. And look again where that cache resides. Since it's not attached to a specific cluster, all users who have proper access privilege can obtain the fastest response times via the result cache. For example, if I ran a query from our company's compute cluster for sales employees, I could email my SQL statement to a colleague in the finance department and when she submits the query, the answer will come back immediately because it was sourced from the result cache. And when she looks at her query's profile, 
she will see that she got a millisecond response time because my query's results were reused. This also means that since her compute cluster did not have to process her query, she was not charged any fees. Common wisdom is that Snowflake keeps a cache around for 24 hours, but there's a lot more to it than that. Each time the result cache for a specific query is reused, Snowflake resets the 24-hour retention period for that query up to a maximum of 31 days from the date and time the query was first executed. Snowflake uses the result cache to avoid regenerating results when the underlying raw data has not changed. So, after the retention period expires, or when the underlying data changes, a new result is generated and cached the next time the query is submitted. There's another caveat about the result cache, and I'll use this query to illustrate it. If I want to take advantage of the free result cache, I need to submit the exact same SQL statement. For example, if I accidentally capitalize a keyword in my second query, like the SELECT command here, or if I inadvertently capitalize the table name, then the query will be reprocessed by a compute cluster using its raw data cache. So to take advantage of the free result cache, the text in your SQL statement has to be identical to the original query's SQL text. The last example queries I'll show will help describe the raw data cache, which is often more useful than the result cache. This cache is local to a specific cluster and is never shared with other clusters. When I executed this query for the first time, columns of data were persisted in the raw data cache when they were transferred over from object storage to answer my specific query. And this data might be useful to a future query, so why not hold on to it? When someone submits the new query below, the compute cluster is instructed to use the raw data cache instead of getting data from object storage because the required data is already local to the cluster. The new query requires a week's worth of data, but this is a subset of the month's worth of data that was previously cached. Below is another new query, but this one can only get some of the required data from the local raw data cache. Data for the tax column will need to be transferred over from object storage since it was not previously cached. The lifespan of the raw data cache does not depend on time. When a compute cluster is suspended, its cache can be purged. When a query is analyzed by the optimizer service, it checks the freshness of the required data in the raw data cache and then builds an execution plan to replace any stale data with fresh data from object storage. When a group of people access similar tables, it's good to have them use the same compute cluster because it increases the likelihood that they will benefit from the raw data cache.